Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. I'm very happy to introduce my guest for this program. He is uh, one of the most, I would say, senior and seasoned and respected UFO researchers and investigators in the world. This is Stan Gordon. Stan has been researching UFO sightings, Bigfoot encounters, and other mysterious events in Pennsylvania since, drumroll, 1959. I don't think there's another researcher around who has been more associated with a particular region in the nation or world than Stan. He's lived in western Pennsylvania, I think, for his whole life or close to it. It's the area he knows and loves. But, of course, his research is universal. It is fascinating. It's uh, it's just amazing. And over the years, Stan's been involved with investigating thousands of unusual incidents. He's led teams of scientists, engineers, research specialists. He's the primary investigator of the 1965 UFO crash incident that occurred near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. It's a very well-known case. Stan has also been taking calls on UFO sightings and other strange reports from the public since 1969. That is a hotline, uh, which is very well-known in the UFO field. And he continues to receive unusual reports on a regular basis. He's lectured frequently on UFOs, Bigfoot, cryptids, Strange Encounters. He was Pennsylvania State Director for MUFON. He's received many awards and recognition over the years. He is the producer of an award-winning UFO video documentary called Kecksburg, The Untold Story. He's the author of four books, Silent Invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot Casebook, Really Mysterious Pennsylvania, and Astonishing Encounters, Pennsylvania's Unknown Creatures. His fourth book is called Creepy Cryptids and Strange UFO Encounters of Pennsylvania, it just was released in March of, 2000, of, of 2022, so quite recently. I have a link to Stan's website below. It is, uh, let me just make sure I've got it here, info, stangordon.info, but I'll have a link below. That's, that's my long introduction, but definitely uh, worthwhile for Stan Gordon. Stan, welcome to the program. It's great to have you here. Uh Thanks for having me on, Richard. It's great to uh, hear your voice again. Same here. So we're doing this uh, old school method. We've got I've got you on a, a a telephone line. That's why we're not doing a visual. But I think this is going to be just wonderful. And um, I'll just start off by by saying I I got interested in wanting to connect with you because of um, a communication I got from you relating to some of your recent research on intelligent balls of light. But I think, you know, we can get into that, and then I, I think there's a lot of other very interesting areas of investigation you're into. But can we start with the balls of light phenomenon? What's going on with that? This is something I've heard about for years, and it's interesting that you're researching this as well. What What's what's the story with this? All right. Well, we'll get into some of the reasons. I'll just give a, your listeners a little bit of history cause, so they understand kind of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people in the field who are really not really aware of some of these type of incidents, uh, I started hearing about these cases back in the 1960s. Uh, I've called them mini UFOs. Some people refer to them as uh, orbs. I mainly talk about these small spheres of light, generally spherical, but not always. There's other configurations sometimes being reported. Interestingly, the smallest ones are about an inch or two in diameter. They're like large, oversized lightning bugs, fireflies of various colors. Majority of them are, again, spherical maybe a golf ball to baseball size, others around a foot or two in diameter. Now, quite often just bright, luminous sources of various colors. In some cases, they appear to be solid and metallic looking. What's so intriguing about these reports, these are not high-level sightings of lights in the sky. These are very low-level, right above the ground, sometimes on the ground, reports of these objects, whatever they are, many in daylight. In recent months, we've had incidents where they come up within feet of witnesses, even in daylight. Uh, they're really intriguing. Over the years, I've had incidents where they've actually followed moving vehicles. I've had them enter people's moving cars through open windows and also into homes through open windows. They quite often just glide around, flood around the house, and go back out through the windows. In some cases, we heard reports they go right through the walls of the vehicle or the homes. So they're very, very fascinating. That's amazing. Uh, I've I've had reports for years and years on these small objects, but since March of this year, around March of this year, we, I've seen a, a very big increase in these type of activities. 
most of these come in from the general public, and it's not just one area. They're coming in from many areas, and it's not just wooded, forested areas where we've had reports for years. We're getting more and more reports in more populated, like housing developments as well. And there has been some uh, security camera footage, for example, of these things coming up where people were notified there was some kind of movement or activity on their property, and when they check back their video, they can see these small spheres of light moving right up to the porch of their homes. Um, very, very intriguing, and I've got some really interesting cases I can uh, talk to you about if mm-hmm. you're interested in hearing about them recently. Yes, very, very. I'm wondering, so is there a color that is typically associated with these uh, balls of light or these spheres or whatever they are? Uh, white, uh, blue is pretty common, and red and orange. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of blue reports, as I recall, over the years on white ones as well. So that's very common. Uh, one of the details I'll give in one of these current reports is kind of interesting as well. Um, a lot of these are people were calling in on my hotline that I've been interviewing. Some other researchers I'm in touch with have always gotten some of these reports. Uh, one of the areas you'll hear me talk about, I'm sure today, will be uh, Fayette County and the Chestnut Ridge. And uh, a lot of activity along that area, the Chestnut Ridge, which goes through Westmoreland, Fayette, Indiana County here in southwest PA. It extends down to a few miles outside of Morgantown, West Virginia. So this ridge area is a little less than 100 miles long. Mm -hmm. But it's a very active area, probably one of the most active areas in the country, and especially certain locations along the ridge for yearly reports of UFO activity, these spheres of light, uh, encounters with Bigfoot, cryptids, and other phenomena as well. But um, one of my research associates, you'll probably hear me mention his name is Jim Brown, He's a researcher up in Fayette County. He's a very high-tech guy. He's uh, very serious. He has some home-built, some very high-tech instrumentation he uses. But um, of the reports that came in this year, and then some of these are very recent. And this would have been October the 8th outside of Uniontown, Pennsylvania. And um, he interviewed the witness, the, the husband and wife, and it was around 6 o'clock in the morning. The fellow was pretty cold outside in, his, in the 40s and decided to get the early morning paper. So he was just in his uh, slippers and robe, and uh, he decided to uh, go outside to get the paper. So the paper box about 50 feet away, and he recalled seeing this glowing white ball of light about 10 to 12 inches in diameter between him and the paper box. And then, this was a very interesting point, he said he began to feel very, very sleepy at that point. And later, when he talked to his wife, he recalled that this spherical object was making slow circular motions um it was again between him and the porch and at around seven o'clock in the morning his wife was looking for him and was startled to see that he was sound asleep on the porch in that cold weather in his in his um sleeping uh apparatus Mm -hmm. and uh anyhow when she woke him uh he said that he had gotten so so tired he couldn't stay awake and that was really intriguing because of this next report which happened days later about 40 miles away up in the laurel ridge area so the laurel ridge area is just a short distance over from a section of the chestnut ridge and there's a lot of activity also in some areas around there as well but it was around 2 30 in the morning this woman is awakened she goes to the restroom she comes out of the restroom and about five feet away in her living room now she has one of these older homes very high ceiling And she notices this deep blue uh, sphere about a foot and a half in diameter just hovering there very low. And she said it it was deep blue in color. But inside of that sphere, she could see this gray swirling mass that looked something like one of those old lava lamps. And the object was solid as the slug moved up and down. She took one step towards it, she recalled. And when she did, she felt like a slight tingling sensation. And she said it reminded her of like a pre joint electricity when she's near an electric fence. She recalled looking at that object for about 10 seconds and then became very, very tired. And she merely went into bed and fell asleep. And she told me later, she said, that is so unusual for me. She said, I'm an insomniac. She said, I don't fall asleep. I have no explanation. And she said the next day when she woke up, she was very, very sluggish and very, very groggy. That's just an example of some of the kind of reports that have been coming in. That's fascinating. And that's just only a month and a half ago. This is quite recent. Um, and there's been some more similar, uh, more recent reports as well. So I wonder, 
um, the whole thing about being sleepy, that, isn't that interesting? Like this yeah. phenomenon clearly is affecting us um, maybe cognitively, definitely in our physiological reactions. And I mean, what do you what do you think this is? Can I ask you what you're have you speculated about this? I, I'd like to hear some more of these stories. But what do you think is what is this? Is, is this a ball? This can't be ball lightning, can it? Like a natural um, phenomenon? I, I wouldn't think so. But how long do these no, things we, last? Ball lightning is a brief kind of a thing, isn't it? How long do these do these balls of light last for? Well, According sometimes it's for several minutes, so they move away, or sometimes they accelerate, or they go up into the sky, or they go off into the woods and just keep going. So it's not something that takes place just for a few seconds. And in these type of conditions we're having them in, again, all year round reports come in, both UFOs, but like we'll talk about specifically right now, these mm. strange spheres of light. Yeah. Um, we don't have the weather conditions. There's no storms. It's clear activity. There's no conditions for this type of thing. And again, some of these objects appear not to be just light sources, but there's some cases where they appear to be more solid and metallic. But here's another really interesting one, April of this year, April 6th. Mm -hmm. And this and it's up in Fayette County, and Jim Brown investigated. And uh, he got on the scene of this case within 45 minutes after it happened. So it's, it's a nice day. A man and his wife are outside. This occurred around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They're out in their field. Uh, they have their wheelbarrow. They're digging some topsoil, filling some holes in the ground. When suddenly they see about 50 feet away, what they thought at first was a mylar balloon. They see the silver circle object about two feet in diameter. And mm -hmm. they watch this thing. It's only about 10 feet above the fence line, slowly moving towards them. And as it gets closer and closer, they realize this is not a balloon. This object is now getting physically brighter and brighter as it gets closer. But as it gets quite close to them, they said it like exploded. And they said there was like a small lightning bolt shot from the object to the ground. This, the explosive sound was like that of a small firecracker followed by a snap like a spark. The spark started a small fire in the field, which they immediately put out. And they noticed that about 100 feet away along the path that the object was moving towards them, there was also another small fire that they uh, went and put out. Um, That's incredible. They, That's amazing. Yeah, they were stunned. But Jim gets out there within 45 minutes. He gets to the scene. There's no residue or debris at all. Had they had a firecracker or a mylar balloon exploded, there should have been residue everywhere. There was nothing whatsoever at the scene. Did this thing look like a solid object to the witnesses, or did it look more like a light phenomenon? My understanding was that it was silver and circular and looked like a solid object. And it, and it physically got more intense and luminosity as they were looking at it. But then it seemed to kind of explode, as it were. Yeah. And then that's was a very gone. unusual one for me, too. And we started a fire. Had... <laughs> started a fire, no less. Yeah, and there was another case a few years ago up in uh, uh, several miles from there. Of course, different witnesses, too. But uh, this was in November of 2019, and this was near the Mason County area. And a man uh, around 430, he was riding down the road to get to his home when in front of him he sees this object about two feet in diameter on the ground, this spherical object on the ground. And... Um, he realizes, well, whatever this thing is, it looks like a big ball, then I'm going to have to uh, get out there and I'm going to have to move this thing. So as he opens the car door and he starts to suddenly move towards it, the object begins to suddenly fade away, vanish, and disappears before he gets to it. These are incredible stories. I recall reading a number of these in uh, over many years of research you know, when you're reading about UFO reports in general, every now and then you, one would come across these types of reports of these spheres. Uh, the ones that I recall reading the most were like a, a dull orange color uh, frequently. Uh, and they, they're around, I think they're probably around the world. They're definitely around the United States. I recall reading several of uh someone driving on a, along a California highway back in, I think, the 70s. This is a long time ago. And it was a basketball-sized sphere that was just seen moving across across the road, across the highway. And um, I, I recall a, a bunch of these kinds. In fact, I'll just share with you, I have a, 
a local friend. Uh, I've known him for many years. Really great guy. And in 19, let's see, 78, he uh, was living in a suburb of Rochester, New York, and he had a stepdaughter in 1978. I think she was a young teenager. And he said to me, yeah, she um, she got woke up out of her sound sleep at like 2 or 2.30 in the morning and instinctively looked outside her bedroom window and saw an orange glowing sphere of light in the backyard. And the next thing she remembered, she went out in her nightgown. It was summertime, so the weather was good. So she's out in her nightgown in this backyard at 2.30 in the morning, and that was the last thing that she remembered. And then uh, she just described it to the family. But I thought that was an interesting story. And it, uh, he was very, like, absolutely adamant that this, this was the case, this happened. I don't, I don't know any of the details of how, um, of what happened or how they learned about it. But I just thought this thing seemed to have a kind of telepathic connection to her because I don't think it was a coincidence that she woke up at that time and looked out her window and saw this orange glowing ball of light. Do you get any of these reports where it's the middle of the night and someone uh, just kind of walks out and sees these things? Does that ever happen? Or or is there any evidence that there's a mental connection? Yes. In some cases, we've heard these type of reports. But now it's not just with the, the small spheres of light, these small orbs or many UFOs. I've also had many cases over the years. You know, I've dealt with thousands and thousands of witnesses. I deal with these cases almost every day on current or past reports. It's just amazing what goes on out there. And I've had many, many very credible people tell me that they were awakened during the night and something told them they needed to go outside. And in some cases, these people have had some very detailed UFO cases. Some people, as I recall over the years, actually took some pretty interesting pictures. They couldn't recall even when or where it happened, but they remember going out and being called out to go out for whatever reason. So, yes, I've heard those reports. But let me tell you also, Richard, let me give you an example of another mini UFO case that is not mm-hmm. a sphere. Just okay. to give you an idea of variation. So this goes back to October 2017. This was down in Fayette City, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is down in the Mon Valley area, I believe, along the Mon River outside of Pittsburgh, where a lot of weird things go on all along those small communities down around there from UFOs, the Bigfoot sightings, and other phenomena. But mm-hmm. this was early morning. Um, it was cold outside. And the fellow got up early. It was a nice fellow got up and went on his wife's car. And the down, the driveway area was all illuminated, so it was very bright. He could see very clearly. He's walking down the steps towards his wife's car when he's about 10 to 12 feet away from her vehicle, but he sees something by the right bumper. And he said, I don't know how to describe this thing to you. He said it was only about two feet tall and shaped like a haystack. He said it was translucent and shiny and had a milky white color. There were like vertical ribs that seemed to be like the superstructure that looked like chrome straws that could be seen through the translucent structure. And he said this thing was gliding about one to two inches off the ground, and it was motionless when he first saw it. He got to about six feet away from this thing when it must have sensed that he was there, and it suddenly zoomed extremely fast across the driveway to the left side of the car, made a perfect right angle turn along the driver's side into the darkened area, and he never saw it again, and he has no idea what it was. How extraordinary. I I mean, honestly, it strikes me as definitely related to what we call the, the basic UFO phenomenon, you know, seeing craft and sometimes beings. It just strikes me as very compatible with that. It seems like they're doing some kind of... Um, surveillance well i mean i don't i don't really know what the purpose of these probes are have you wondered about this have you wondered like who is behind this what are these for what is going on do you have any ideas or theories well i speculate about this back in the 60s and 70s on hearing these reports and when i first heard about them i was under the opinion that possibly these were some type against some type of probe that will send me back audio and video data to another source, whatever that was. But now over many, many years, including a lot of incidents in more recent years and 
what I uncovered during that massive UFO Bigfoot outbreak in 1973, which we can talk about, mm -hmm. that's when I began to realize that there was a lot more to the, the spheres of light, to the UFO phenomena, and even to Bigfoot than I had ever imagined, because I surely wasn't looking for this, nor were my research associates. And um, it got much stranger and stranger. So just to give an example, just to give an idea of what was going on during that massive wave of 1973, mm -hmm. you know, that's when I had, luckily in 1970, I had founded my first of three volunteer research groups that would investigate incidents across the state. The first group was founded in 1970, and it was kind of unique in that many of the people involved, most involved were specialists. We had all types of scientists, engineers, technicians, police officers, former military specialists. We all did this voluntarily around our full-time jobs. Uh, with my electronics background, I set up a elaborate communication center in my home and a two-way radio dispatch system, so we dispatched some of the researchers out to the scene quickly. Uh, by 1973, we had extended the cover of the whole state of Pennsylvania, and we were surprised that we were beginning to get referrals from law enforcement, from news media across the state, so we were jammed with calls coming in. And we were just very, very lucky that we had already pretty well set up when 1973 comes around. Now, you remember, Richard, very well, in the fall of 73, the United States experienced quite a wave of UFO activity was covered extensively in the news media. Yeah. But back here in Pennsylvania, Back in Pennsylvania, starting January 1st and continued to the last day of the year, we had the biggest UFO wave ever documented. There were hundreds and hundreds of UFO reports coming in. And many of them were not lights in the sky. Many of these were low-level, what appear to be large structured objects, uh, gee, following vehicles, hovering over highways. There were landing reports. There were cases with electromagnetic effects involved. It was an amazing time just trying to keep up with all these UFO cases. And in the summer of 73, we had the biggest outbreak of Bigfoot sightings ever documented that went into 1974. Dozens and dozens of Bigfoot sightings, sometimes more than one creature. Many of these sightings were in daylight. Um, and sometimes, again, there were more than one creature. Mm -hmm. And quite a lot of cases, my teams would be out on the scene with a minutes to hours documenting, investigating these incidents, and there'd be some type of physical evidence at the scene. Let me just tell you this very briefly. Yes, please. I, from what, what I knew about Bigfoot, I was investigating Bigfoot sightings back in the 1960s in Pennsylvania. From what I knew about these things, I thought they were some type of unknown primate, some type of unknown creature. Well, as all these incidents began to happen in 1973, a lot of very strange things began to come to our attention. And, and we all have to remember, 1973, there's no cell phones. There's no internet like it is today. Most people, if they were frightened, something happened unusual, they called the police and the newspapers. That's right. And then we were getting a lot of referrals from those sources, or they're calling my hotline. But um, that's when things began to get very strange. Um, one of the things was we get out to some of these locations within a short time after these alleged creature encounters under all type of ground conditions and different weather conditions, including the winter when there's snow. So we've had these these uh, strange footprints, large tracks in most cases, with big strides that we would follow for a distance that would just abruptly stop and end when there should have been more tracks. Ah. There couldn't have been, there's no way it could have been fabricated. And by the way, that's going on all around the country even more recent years. But anyhow, then we began to see this pattern. We'd have a UFO sighting in a particular area. Within minutes, hours, days later, we'd have a Bigfoot sighting or vice versa. And then we had some of those incredible cases, which I think you even mentioned, may have mentioned in your first book, uh, with UFOs and Bigfoot seen together at the same time and place. And that's when things really began to make us scratch our head, like, what are we doing? If with? I mentioned that, I was probably working off of your research, <laughs> if I can, um, most likely, because I th you're, you're one of the unique people who you're not just a fearless UFO investigator, but you've, you do, you've done Bigfoot research for years. And there's not many people who, who actively do both of those. I mean, I don't know of too many, um, a small handful. So in fact, your, your book about 1973 is um, I, a book that I have, and I recall reading and being very impressed by the density of sightings of UFOs and Bigfoots in, I, if I'm, Correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, it's not simply an isolated Bigfoot sighting or an isolated UFO. I think 
are there there are cases where they were seen more or less in the same area at the same time, or am I wrong? Oh, you're correct. And yeah. and again, you know, yes, I started writing about these cases back in the early 1970s. Yeah. And uh, you know, it was it was a, a different time period. Uh, I was in touch with a lot of the, the well-known names in the UFO Bigfoot field during that time, and I started publishing some of these very strange reports and these cases that I can give you a little more detail about if you like. But anyhow, mm -hmm. a lot of people in the Bigfoot field, of course, did not want to associate Bigfoot for Uf with UFOs and vice versa. Yeah. And that's still the same today. Exactly. But there's more and more people now, more investigators and more witnesses all around the country, around the world, who are now reporting and are getting reports and are experiencing things what I wrote about back in the 70s that are happening now all across the country, and they're not laughing so much. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, among the details, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. One of the cases we had in September of 73 north of Pittsburgh, you had two witnesses seeing the seven, eight-foot-tall Bigfoot covered with white hair running across the road towards the woods, but it was carrying a small, luminous ball of light in its one hand. And well, a well, short time when, later— When was this? this large, I'm sorry to interrupt. This was the— September of 1973, okay. during that big wave. Carrying a ball of light. Right. Uh, keep going. You have, so sorry. <laughs> after that happens, this large, luminous object comes across the sky and projects a beam of light down in the woods where the creature ran into. And then other areas were reporting on their properties where they are seeing these Bigfoot creatures, these strange light phenomena or UFO activity around there as well. Can I just uh, interrupt to make sure I'm understanding this and the listener? So this was yep. a, a, a white furred Bigfoot going through, and I don't know if it was a wooded area. It's, it's, it's carrying a ball of light or holding, and then there's a beam of light coming from above, from a craft from, presumably, from a, and the and the creature went into that beam of light. Is, uh, you're is, pretty close. The object was said. running across the roads towards the woods, carrying the small sphere of light. Mm -hmm. A short time later. This large object came across the sky, projected a beam of light down into the woods where the creature had run into. Okay, okay. So we didn't, you didn't, no one saw the, the creature go into the light itself, but it was possibly the same area. Possibly yeah, it was the in thing. the same general area. That's correct. And these okay. kind of cases have become more and more. But what's been going on over the years, and here in Pennsylvania, in areas where there's a history of Bigfoot activity, and you can have Bigfoot sightings anywhere. There's certain areas where there's a history of recurring activity reported by hunters and outdoorsmen and many other people. And for years now, witnesses and researchers are reporting seeing these small orbs of light or other light phenomena in those general areas. And, um, and just to give you an, an idea, here was um, another case that occurred outside of the Pittsburgh area in, in May of 2019. So here's a fella who lived out in the country, happened to get up around, um, I think it was around 1 o'clock in the morning, he looked out the window, and his backyard goes into a wooded area, and it's very well illuminated. He sees a smaller Bigfoot, and they're not all 6 to 9 feet tall. Some are smaller. This one was around 4.5 to 5 feet tall, covered with long, very dark uh, hair on the head and the back. You can see it. He was walking upright with very long arms extending down past the knees. He got a good look at this thing. And as he's watching this thing, it enters a particular area of the woods. Within three seconds of the exact location where the creature had entered the woods, a bright sphere of light, small, about three or four inches in diameter, suddenly appears. And that sphere is about four feet above the ground. And suddenly it vanishes. A few seconds later, it reappears about 10 feet away. And this time that small sphere emits a bright beam of light about 10 to 12 feet long. And after a few seconds, that beam of light vanishes. It's amazing. Did you t did you say when this one was? Did I just miss that? Was this another 1973 case? No, this was May of 2019. Oh God, I'm so sorry you said. That. Yeah. Uh, you're you're blowing my mind with these cases. What what fascinates me? Well, many things, but uh, the fact that you're doing investigations of a phenomenon that do that does not fit in a in a nice little box that we want to put it in. Like, I, and I, I include myself here. I've always wanted the UFO phenomenon to fit into a nice, logical little box. Like, okay, there's, there's beings from another planet. They're here in these metal spaceships, and this is how they behave. But there's just so much more that's bizarre. 
about this entire subject, including the whole Bigfoot connection, which UFO researchers love to run away from. They're terrified of the Bigfoot phenomenon. I'll just say, I mean, I don't know the Bigfoot subject anywhere, anywhere like you do, but many years ago, I did interview a few Bigfoot witnesses as well. And um, the thing that struck me was just they, they sounded exactly like UFO witnesses in every way, you know. There, there was really no difference. Uh, I remember talking to one uh, young man who's a hunter out in Oregon. And he said, uh, I was out alone and I came across a, a, a stream. There was a large Bigfoot creature there. We looked at each other. He said we were like 90 feet away or less than that. And I'm thinking in terms of baseball, that's like, that's a run to first base from home. That's not far. <laughs> so he's looking at this creature. It's looking at him. And... And I asked a, a, probably a silly question, but it was normal. I was like, well, how do you know this wasn't a bear? And he said, look, I'm a hunter. I know what a bear looks like. And he said also, um, what did he say? Oh, he said, this was brown and we don't have brown bears. We only have black bears in that area. But this thing he said was standing up like a, like a man, like a, like a creature, like a hominid. And, um, and so he just, he didn't turn away. He just slowly backed away. I think he was afraid. But he said he had a good look at it. And when I was talking with him, I thought, this guy is completely believable to me. And I, I discovered this is how big, you know, Sasquatch or Bigfoot witnesses are. They are every bit as uh, logical and, you know, rational as any, any good UFO witness I've run into. I'm sure you've found the same. I have no, oh, yeah. well, there's no difference there. So it's an uncomfortable correct. thing. It's like, do I now? This is another weird thing I'm supposed to believe in, <laughs> and uh, but here you go. Like you, you can't run away from the evidence, right? You see the evidence. There it is. So, do you think what is there a connection? Uh, I wasn't really expecting to get into this, but it is fascinating. Do you think there's a a connection between these creatures and the UFO phenomenon? Well, I, I don't think there's any doubt. There's some correlation. We just don't know what it is. Yeah. But um, yeah, there again. When I'll tell you some details ago, like about a couple of the cases from 73 that mm -hmm. convinced me we're dealing with something that's very, very strange and unusual, more than just an unknown animal. And as I'm describing these cases, you've got to understand what I'm trying to make people realize is I am not suggesting that Bigfoot is a passenger in a spacecraft from another planet or extraterrestrial. Because we don't know for sure what the UFO or UFE phenomena really is. Mm -hmm. I said years ago... It's very possible there's more than one origin to the unknown category of the UFO phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, what I've learned about the, the Bigfoot mystery, as weird as it sounds, and there's very, very good case for this now, again, not just for my case, but for many other researchers around the country and around the world, that whatever we're dealing with has a physical and a non-physical component to it. For lack of a better term, I'll say it's interdimensional. But there's similarities, as you know well, as you'll hear, with some of the UFO phenomena, some of the different type of reports coming in of what people are seeing, observing, and similar to a lot of the Bigfoot phenomena that a lot of people are not aware of. But uh, if you want me to tell you about some of those 73 cases, uh, there's two cases in particular that stand out among dozens and dozens of reports. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. We'd be very interested. Well, okay, this one case now, and I believe you talked about it in your book. I think you did. Uh, it's a very detailed case. I'm going to shorten as much as I can, but I think it's very important so people understand there is some association between the two anomalies. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So this yeah. was October 25th, 1973, uh, in a rural area outside of Uniontown, Pennsylvania, up in Fayette County. Uh, there were many UFO incidents coming in during 24 hours on my UFO hotline on that day. But it was around 10.30 that night when I get a call from a state trooper from the Uniontown Barracks. And he just came back from investigating this multiple witness UFO landing. That was very, very unusual when you hear the details. Mm -hmm. And he said, I think there's a good chance of something still up in the pasture. Can you get one of your teams up here as soon as possible? Well, we're distance away, but we did. We've got our team together. We've got our, our radios, our radiation meters, other equipment, and found our way up to Fayette County. I'm sure we spent probably the whole night up there. And um, it was an amazing case. The, the very short part of the story is this. You had 15 witnesses in this rural area. They observed this barn-sized red ball, 
about 100 feet off the ground, hovering and slowly beginning to move downward. Hmm. Uh, the farmer's son, who lived in town, was coming out to visit his family at his dad's farm, and he sees the object, and he sees people standing outside looking at this big red sphere. Looks like it's coming down the land in the pasture. So he goes to a better location to a neighbor's to get a better look, and he and the two young neighbor boys watch this thing. It looked like it's going to land, so they want to see what this thing was. So they go over to his dad's farm. He grabs a thirty got six and a handful of ammunition. <laughs> Within that ammunition, he had two tracer bullets. So the, those out there hunt know when you fire that tracer bullet, you just get that luminous trail. Yeah, it shows the trajectory. Anyhow, they start making their way down that farm road towards the pasture. The dogs around the area are carrying on; they're, they're just barking extensively. They. Uh, hear this high-pitched whining noise and these loud baby crying sounds. As you get closer and closer a loud to the pasture area... baby sounds crying sounds? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. That's, that's okay. weird. That's interesting. Okay, keep going. I'm sorry. The, the, they angle their vehicle with the headlights on so they can see their path up the hill, and they notice it looks like something is draining the power from their headlights. They never noticed that before. As they move up towards the pasture, they get up to the top, they're standing there in amazement. About 250 feet away, this huge object has now landed on the ground or right above it. It is now not a complete round sphere. It is like a half a sphere, like a big white dome, about 100 feet in diameter. It's flat, it looks flat on the bottom. It's illuminating the area, making that loud whining noise. They just stand there in amazement. They can't believe what they're seeing, but it got even stranger. Uh, a few minutes later, their attention's drawn to a barbed wire fence about 75 feet away. Along that barbed wire fence are these two huge hair-covered Bigfoot-type creatures, one behind the other, <coughs> slowly walking in their direction. The one in front is about 8 feet tall. The one behind is about 7 feet tall. They're moving upright. They're bipedal. They're moving very slowly, one behind the other. They're covered with long, dark, matted, I believe it was grayish, brownish hair. The arms are so long, they're hanging past the knees, almost down to the ground. They have no neck. The eyes are large and luminous, bright green, and they're making that whining baby crying sound. Well, the one young boy so scared, he ran out of the field. Uh, the other young boy yells to the older fella, shoot him, shoot him. <laughs> so the fella fires his first shot. The first shot's a tracer. He fires over their head. No response. He fires the second tracer, but this time is interesting. He fires that second tracer. The largest of the two creatures reaches out as though to grab that tracer and makes a loud, whining, baby crying sound. And that huge, luminous object in the field at that time vanishes and disappears. It doesn't accelerate and leave. It's just gone. Most of the luminosity is gone. The sound stops. The creatures turn around slowly and start walking back along the fence line. At that point, he's firing live ammo from his 30 6 into the creature's with no effect on it whatsoever. They run back to the truck, go to the farmhouse, told the family what happened, took, called the neighbors. Uh, rather, they went to the neighbors, called the state police. The state trooper arrives 45 minutes later. He said um, they went up in the troop car to look for evidence. And he said when they got to the scene, the area where the object had been on the ground was self-luminescent and glowing, about 100 feet or more in diameter. He said the animals, the farm animals, wouldn't go into it. He said um, that um, he shined this flashlight beam. He could barely see it. And he told me, he said, if I had a newspaper, I'm certain I could have read the newspaper from the luminosity coming off the globe. Wow. That's, that, that's the short part of the story. They were taken back to the barracks, I was told. Both the trooper and the witness were taken to two separate rooms, separately interviewed. Then they called me and sent up my team. When we arrived on the scene, uh, the radiation levels in that area were normal. The glow was gone. Hmm. The farm animals still would not go near it. I don't have time to go into the whole story. What developed during the night was probably one of the strangest cases on record that you may remember the name, Dr. Berthold Schwartz, who was interested in these cases yeah. back in the 70s. This he, is, he we're getting into some arcane uh, names. I, that's vaguely, that is familiar to me. I'm, I'm, yes. Okay. By the way, I never, I did not write about this um, because I'm hearing this. I feel like I'm hearing this for the first time. I don't think I, I don't think I covered this case. It's fascinating. Okay. So fascinating. anyhow, uh, Dr. Schwartz spent a week up here interviewing the people, went back convinced they were all telling the truth. And Richard, there's one thing I don't think I mentioned to you. I, I do a lot of interviews and I couldn't remember. 
I've been doing this now for 63 years. I have never personally seen a Bigfoot or a UFO. I've seen a lot of evidence, but I've never had my own personal encounter. Mm -hmm. I can just tell you, the more I know about the phenomenon we're dealing with, the stranger it is. And again, for a lack of a better term, I'll call it interdimensional. There's a physical and a non-physical component to it. But there was, but there was another case, not far from this location, also in Fayette County, way up in the mountain in February of 74. It was the case that convinced me and my team that we're dealing with something that's far more unusual than an unknown animal with the UFO connection. Uh, yes. What is What are the details of this one? Okay. So this is February 6, 1974. And um, you may remember it, but I'm sure some of your listeners do. There was a big national trucker strike taking place at that time. There was gas rationing around the country. Many people remember that. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot. There was violence going on across the country and here in Pennsylvania. So you had members of the uh, state police and National Guard patrol patrolling together. You had members of both units respond to this case. Uh, there was no gas available here in my town, so I couldn't get up to the scene early the next morning. Yeah, we had the so it was the uh, time of the oil embargo, I believe. The uh, Arab uh, oil embargo, perhaps? That was in, started in 73? It, it, it was a big national uh, strike going on. I think that's what the main oh, okay. thing was. I, I okay. don't remember all the details. Okay. But uh, anyhow, this uh, here's a woman that evening's in her little cabin home deep in the mountains. Nothing, you know, it's normal night. She's watching TV. She hears this commotion on her little front porch. She had some empty soda cans, some empty pop cans out there. Something was rattling the pop cans around, and her first thought was, well, a few weeks prior, there had been a pack of dogs, wild dogs came through, and she thought, I bet the dogs are back. So she thought, you know what, I'll just grab my 16-gauge double barrel shotgun, <laughs> and I'll fire her over their head, and I'll scare those dogs away. Right. So she proceeds to grab her shotgun. She loads one chamber. She walks up to the front door. She opens up the front door. She turns on the switch to turn the light on. She steps out, and when she does... Six feet in front of her is a seven-foot-tall, uh, gray-haired Bigfoot standing there. As soon as she turned to put the light on, it put his arm straight up over its head. Good grief. And how did she react? She pulled the trigger and fired right into it. <gasps> she said there was this bright, bright flash of light, like the strobe on a camera. And that creature physically vanished and disappeared. But it gets even more interesting. Her, her in-laws lived 100 feet away. They heard the gunshot. They called her and asked her what was she was shooting at. She tried to tell them. Her son-in-law grabs a sidearm. He starts walking down that, that road towards her cabin, that dark road. He saw a, a figure running down. He couldn't tell who, what it was, who it was. But at some point, he said he was surrounded by four or five hairy people with eyes like coals of fire. Started shooting at him randomly. And about the same time, there's this large, luminous UFO like a big Christmas ornament, they said, hovering over the trees at the same time. That's when they called the state police. And I talked to the, the primary investigator. He said, by the time they found this location deep in the mountains, the activity was over. He said, something very strange happened out there. He said, when he got on the scene, he said, one, the witnesses were very, very shaken. They gave a very detailed account. He believed they were telling the truth. But he said, what convinced him was the animal reactions. Now, I told you, I've never seen a Bigfoot or UFO. I've seen the animal reactions many times over the years when I got on the scene within minutes, hours after these incidents occurred. Even the most vicious dogs, when they're near Bigfoot, in a lot of cases, they will not bark. They just stand still. They shake. They cower sometimes. They mm -hmm. won't e even eat right sometimes, two or three days later. Very, very common. By the way, as some of you hear with some UFO cases as well, which I'm sure you're aware of, but anyhow, uh, they had other animals on the farm. They had several big dogs. And he said, those dogs wouldn't even move. It wouldn't make a sound. And when I got there early the next morning with my team, all the dogs were barking again. That was the case, among others that I had, that suggested we're dealing with something, again, that is not a physical animal. They come and they go. They hear and they're gone. And, Richard, now you're aware of this, being involved in these cases for many years. You look at many of the UFO cases, UAP cases that have been going on for years and years, and you've, you've even heard some bits and pieces about some similar details with some of the Navy reports that have come out in the last few years. But 
and many, many UFO cases I've investigated, many in daylight. In fact, many in recent weeks and months in daylight here in Pennsylvania. So you have these objects that sometimes suddenly appear out of nowhere, look like solid physical objects, especially a lot of these reports, which, of course, we're hearing the tic tac description mm-hmm. but many people whatever they call them cigar shaped elliptical shaped objects that in some cases they're hovering they in some cases they suddenly begin to slowly fade away and vanish in other cases they change from one physical form into another uh sometimes we have objects where you can see the solid outline moving across the sky and you can see right through them and then we have many incidents of objects entering co- clouds and even very strange cloud formations that are making erratic movements in the sky even the last year here in daylight that clouds don't do. But these objects enter these clouds and they never come back out. So you've got some similarities with some of the UFO encounters being reported and with Bigfoot. Because with Bigfoot, and again, a lot of this are things people have never heard of. Mm -hmm. We have many cases where people were within 5, 10, 20, 30 feet away from these creatures. Even in daylight, in some cases, very, very close. What appear to be solid physical creatures that in some cases just suddenly appear out of nowhere in front of a vehicle. They walk across the road and they're gone. In some cases, the creatures look physically solid to a degree, but sometimes parts of the body are more misty or foggy looking or they're out of focus. And it's the same thing you've got to remember with the footprints, where in some cases they just abruptly end where there should be more tracks. That's an interesting uh, element about the uh, the footprints. Well, all of this is interesting, Stan, honestly. And by the way, I just want to uh, point out, again, your website is stangordon.info. And I'm looking at it right now, and I would encourage listeners to take a look at your website. You have, uh, there's articles galore. And uh, I'm looking at articles that have a lot of drawings of UFO encounters um, this is really a great resource. So um, I, again, I've got this link below for people to take a look at. I want to ask you about the uh, the disappearing footprints again, because uh, I, I again I don't I don't know the Bigfoot or Sasquatch uh, phenomenon anything like you do, but I do know like there have been people who've said, well, you know, you can create fake Bigfoot footprints. You can get a big thing. But I've also listened to people analyzing that and saying, now, nah, look, you can you can always tell if it's if it's put down, if it's fake or not. And I remember someone talking about looking for the what is it? The metatarsal ridge, I think. And I don't even remember if I don't know my anatomy that well. But uh, but also there are ways of studying the footprints as well to, to see where the pressure points are, to see if this is actually someone walking or if it's just a guy wearing fake feet. But the fact that these footprints disappeared is also very, very interesting. Is that a common thing or is that just once in a while that you've uncovered that? It's not. It's ongoing at times over the years. It's not something that you hear regularly. But again, these are cases that have happened not only in Pennsylvania that I've investigated, but I'm aware of many similar accounts that other well-known research and others around the country have had reports as well. These things have been reported all over the country. Yeah. You know, like I said, uh, Rich, we talked about this, and I wrote about this back in the 70s. And the last few years now, there are several other very good books that are out covering the same type of information from around the country. Yeah. Many cases like this are being reported now. And it's something people aren't in the big field. They're not a lot of them are not laughing so much. I, I can tell you here recent months, uh, some of the big researchers I know in Pennsylvania, some of these guys are very experienced uh, and open minded, but skeptical. And we yeah. talked for years about these small orbs of light. And in the last several months, in one of the areas now where we have recurring reports of various anomalies being reported, they encountered themselves having right. the experience of having these spheres come up within a few feet of them. And let me tell you, they were, I think, quite shaken over the experience. The uh, let me ask so you. This going on. Well, I'm sorry. Can I ask you this one question? Are you aware in all of your years of investigating the, the Bigfoot cases of anyone actually faking or trying to hoax a Bigfoot sighting? Are, I mean, does this actually happen? I mean, I, I hear these claims, but I really wonder how common are Bigfoot hoaxers? Uh, do you run into them in your research? Well, again, over so many years of doing this, have there been reports of hoaxes? 
Yes, but very, very few. And I can tell you, mm. during that 1973 wave yeah. of all these sightings that were on, that, you know, all these UFO sightings, Bigfoot sightings, you know, again, it was covered quite a bit after it began to happen and word got out and people were talking, people were getting very shaken because they were making many calls to law enforcement, public safety. They were There was a lot of amazing things going on around this area for weeks and weeks, and people were getting pretty concerned over it. And... Uh, as it began to appear in some of the newspapers, yeah, you had some kids that were out there when they cut some wooden uh, forms out of wood and made some tracks, easily discernible. Yeah. You, you got to remember again, Rich, I had police officers, I had an anthropologist in my group, I had a podiatrist in my group. We had a lot of specialists involved. And we're the first, whether it was the UFO sighting or Bigfoot sighting, when I started out in the field in 1965 investigating these incidents uh, after the Kexford case, the one thing I found, and I've always done this from the beginning, I always try to find a logical explanation for whether it's a Bigfoot or UFO or crypto sighting, mm -hmm. and there are explanations for many of them. Many, many UFO sightings, even in recent years, they're misidentification of natural or man-made objects. So you've got a lot of Starlink satellites. You get big fireball meteors yeah. moving over the air, even in recent weeks. Sure. Uh, you've got rockets that are coming over now. There's a lot of things that look strange and unusual, but you can track a lot of these things down. But every year, we are receiving really detailed reports from a lot of credible people, whether it's a Bigfoot or a UFO sighting. And so have there been hoaxes? Yes. They're very far and few between. Have there been a lot of misidentifications? Yep. Mm -hmm. A lot of really credible people say things will look strange, but there's explanation. Even for Bigfoot, we've had incidents where people have misidentified bear, a lot, very large shaggy dogs, hunters and camouflage outfits, a lot of things like that. But... There are so many incidents of people seeing these creatures, even again in daylight, including one just a couple weeks ago that happened up on the Chestnut Ridge. This would have been uh, November the 9th. So you're talking very, very recently. And I got the call on yeah. this a short time after it happened. And these are two people who owned a lot of property deep in the mountains up in the Indiana side of the Chestnut Ridge. And uh, the woman was just getting light out. She was coming out of one of the buildings on the property. When she caught something out of the corner of her eye, she told me about 80 feet away. She said this thing was easily nine feet tall, covered with uh, gray hair. Uh, it decreed the Bigfoot was carrying a small deer over its shoulder. It was very broad shouldered, she told me. She thinks that actually she kind of scared it. And when it noticed her, it let out one very loud grunt. They had eye contact for a short time. Then it turned, carrying that deer, and when ran through the... Uh, down through the field and then into the woods and was gone. Good grief. This but, is just you know, two weeks ago from this conversation. This is just uh, like 16 days ago. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Wow. There have been uh, several other very good Bigfoot sightings up on other areas of the ridge. Uh, this past Mother's Day afternoon, up on the dairy side of the ridge in Westmoreland County, where we get many reports. And again, there's not sightings just on the ridge. There's many other areas not on the ridge as well, but the ridge is very active. And uh, here was a woman walking a dog, uh, walk beautiful afternoon, and all of a sudden this eight-foot-tall, dark Bigfoot comes out of the woods. She said her dog just stopped, and it wouldn't make, it didn't bark, wouldn't do anything like that at all. The creature never looked at her. It was only about 40, 50 feet away, as I recall, approximately, and it walked back into the woods, never looked towards her whatsoever. And But these are the kind of things, these things are going on so much more calmly than people realize. And UFO sightings, they have been nonstop all year. I mean, amazing cases and reports coming in just from the last few weeks. Um, another sighting you'll find interesting. This just happened uh, November the uh, 3rd, actually. And uh, this was in Mount Pleasant Township. This fellow called me. This was a beautiful, clear morning, 11 and 15 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And this fellow was former military. And he said, I know aircraft. And he said, I saw something I've never seen in my life. And he goes on to describe seeing this. Very large object. It, it wasn't that low to the ground. It was pretty high up. But he said, "I got to go." He said, "At its size, it had to be huge." He said, "As big as a football field." He said, "It was cigar shaped, or he said, kind of like a rectangle with smooth edges and all white in color." And he said, "There was positively no wings on it whatsoever." And he said, "I hurried, I hurried down the road about forty-five uh, seconds later and stopped to get a better view." And he said, "I'm watching this thing and." As I got there, got it out of my vehicle, and it's gone. He said, I had a beautiful view of the sky. There's no place for it to go. He didn't know that for weeks and months. 
there have been multiple reports of these very large metallic cigar-shaped objects hovering in the sky that suddenly just vanish and disappear. They don't accelerate and leave. They're just vanished and they're gone. That's a, yeah, extraordinary. Hey, we've actually gone for almost an hour. I cannot believe this. Um, I am actually amazed. So what um, I'm going to, when after we wrap this up, I'm just going to encourage people to check out the uh, a continuation of this conversation, which will be on my website over at Richard Olin Members. If you're a member of the website, you, you'll be able to uh, check it out very easily. Here's my observation about uh, some of the things you've been saying. First of all, I, uh, we started off by talking about these very interesting spherical balls of, of light that behave intelligently, um, that, that often can seem to make people drowsy and put them to sleep. And we moved into the, the Bigfoot sightings, which I actually wasn't expecting to do here, but I'm so glad that you went there. And, uh, and then even you know, saw connections between the Bigfoot sightings with these balls of light. And I think that's very interesting. And then the other thing I just would um, I observe here is your your research. Um, I think your research is unique because, as far as I can tell, you have you have dedicated yourself to actually uh, manning a hotline, but primarily for local sightings in the western portion of Pennsylvania. I'm sure there's other areas you've covered, but. The impression I've had is it's really Western Pennsylvania and that that region, and what's fascinating is you've been essentially full time dedicated to getting the reports, and there's a lot. I have I've got to think if anyone were to do the same thing that you're doing in other parts of the world, they would probably. I'm guessing there's a good chance they'd get a similar density of of very unusual reports, but I don't think there's many people doing that. You got MUFON groups out there; they take reports. But I don't know. I don't. I don't think that they publicize these things the same way that you do. You've been doing this for so long. I I feel like you're you're unique in the kind of work that you have done. And again, I w- I want people to um, see your website because you keep things up to date. And and before I give you a final word here, I just want to ask you if in the future you let me uh, interview you again to keep up on current sightings and encounters that are going on in your region, if that's okay with you. Uh, Rich, sure, I'd be glad to keep you updated. And reports come in all the time. Again, right through reports come in even the last week. Of course, sightings have been ongoing. The events of all of this year increasing surprisingly in the fall and winter of uh, 2022 and just continuing right through the last few weeks. It's just amazing. We didn't even talk about some of the really close, low-level UFO activity. It's ongoing right now plus other phenomena. There are many, many other strange creature cases that I've even found a link with in some of these cases we've never even talked about. For example, Mm -hmm. you're aware of incidents with low-level UFOs and electromagnetic effects Mm -hmm. where vehicles begin to lose their power, the headlights dim. Well, many people are unaware of it, but there are Bigfoot encounters the same way that when a Bigfoot is near a vehicle, sometimes they lose power in the vehicle. There's a lot more than this, and people understand. I think it's interesting because what your research uh, really demonstrates is that, you know, the current uh, statements that we get on UAP, which is what they're now called, um, the current conversation publicly on on UAP is just so tame and so, um, I mean, there's just, there's not a lot of the detail in there that really reflects the richness of this phenomenon. But your research does reflect that. And this is another reason I was really excited about uh, interviewing you because the fact that you're, what you're covering is so far beyond the uh, kinds of conversations that we're hearing currently on the UAP subject. So I, just, I want to thank you for the incredible research that you've been doing all these years. And I definitely want to interview you again to deal with some of the more current sightings that are continuing. Um, Can we wrap this portion of the interview up? And I'd like to be able to continue this with you over at Richard Olin Members, if that's okay with you. That's fine. I'd like to just tell your listeners, uh, they can go to my website at stangordon.info. There is contact information on there for my phone and for email, how to reach me. And all of my books, including the new one, Creepy Cryptids, are available on Amazon.com and BarnesNoble.com as well. 
Absolutely. I'm going to uh, have that linked below. And in fact, I'm going to pin that as a top comment uh, as well. So I definitely would like people to uh, go visit your website. I'm looking at it again right now. And you keep it very nicely up to date. And there's uh, a lot of very good uh, subcategories in there as well, including photos and uh, different galleries and stuff on Kecksburg and citing reports and news and much more. So it's actually very, it's a nice website. I think it's easy for people to navigate through. So I would encourage them to check out stangordon.info as well. Um, boy, there's so many more questions I want to ask you. And I'm going to ask you for the next portion of this, which will be over at my website at Richard Ola Members. If, uh, again, if you're listening, you're a member, go check it out. So that's it, that's it for this uh, portion. Stan, Stan Gordon, I just want to thank you so much for being here with me on The Richard Dolan Show. It's been a pleasure. Roger, thanks for having me back on, and I appreciate it, and uh, it's good talking to you again. Well, don't hang up. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I just want to thank everyone for listening. If you like what you see here or listen to, I should say, please do like, do subscribe to my channel. Uh, you know what to do. Help me out with the algorithms, and I will be back again with all of you very, very soon. In the meantime, let's keep our chin up. Let's keep fighting the good fight, and I will catch you all again soon. Later.